-hmm. and I read that mm -hmm. cover to cover. So, so you, you, this is not too surprising in terms of the final, the final, the final report. No, it's not. It, it, I'm not. It's, it's not particularly different from the uh, from the draft, except in key areas where mm -hmm. um, a couple of lines have been added on the recommendations or on the way forward. Mm -hmm. A couple of pages have been put in place for the um, signing off by those who actually prepared the report. Mm -hmm. Little little things like that, mm -hmm. but uh, those little things, you know, add critical value uh, to to what is being reported. For example, um, at the beginning of the whole report. Uh, the original draft uh, referred only to Jeddah, whereas the real draft, the real report now coming up, actually makes a distinction between NYEP and Jeddah as it was set up in 2006. Mm -hmm. So there are some differences, uh, and I think there's an attempt to maybe get some accuracy and historically correct information in there. And then there's also, of course, the attempt to uh, basically <laughs> what some of it is saying is that. And yeah, young one, yeah, yo. Now, MP before Zuka, because NYP, NYP are seven years old. So it didn't so, just look at the tenure of Jida when NBC took over in 2009, hmm. but it tried to go back to when it was NYEP and the MPP. Actually, actually, the way it was set up, because most of the criticism of Jida mm -hmm. was the improperness of the way it was set up. No framework, no okay. legal backing, etc. Et so that's what the, the, the JIDA inherited from NYEP yes. and continued in the and same continued way. continued in the same way, but even more. I see. So did they, and we'll, I'll let you group the, the, the issues, the financial irregularities and all that. Did they cover the entire lifespan of NYEP or was it restricted to only the JIDA years? No, it, it was supposed to cover the entire lifespan, except that the committee or the commission who actually uh, did the report Claim that they were they did not cite any contracts for 2006 to 2008. Okay. So they were a bit porous on that information, mm -hmm. and that has been made very clear in the final report that there was a vacuum. So there was uh, an information. So, so most of the information was from 2009. Most of the information was from 2009 onwards. All right. So how is the report structured, and what did you find as you went through the report? Well, the the, the report the report is good. This is probably one of the better reports that I have seen ever written uh, as an indictment against uh, government services. Mm. So it's very clear. It, it, actually, it actually points at individual persons. It points at individual contracts. It examines and criticizes all the loopholes and the gaps in, in the report. So it starts off with a nice preamble and the executive summary. Actually, if you read just the executive summary of the report, you get a gist of everything that uh, is, is, is going to be addressed. Mm. Then it goes on further to talk about the history of JEDA, it talks about the uh, the parameters of, of JIDA, the limits of JIDA, the reasons why JIDA existed and why it is still a valid uh, a unit to have today. And then it goes on to look at all of the issues in detail as it picks them up from the summary and, 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 and looks at every single uh, project that they examine. Um, one thing that we have to be very clear about, the commission uh, also says very clearly that they did not have enough time to actually go regional and look at most of the regional, uh, municipal, and district issues that, that existed on JIDA, which tells you that there's a lot more out there that we have not seen yet. So this was a very centralized, the focus on the, the center, which is the headquarters. This was the focus on the center and also the focus on the legitimacy mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and, and, and the, probably the, the, the policy and the framework okay. of how JIDA was set up. But um, it would have been, it, it, it is probably better uh, for us to say that the JIDA report, as we see it today, is incomplete. Mm. There's a little, there's a lot more work to be done. All right. Uh, just remind us. I don't know if Godfrey will do this or Sydney. How did the committee even begin to work? What led to a committee being set up? Was it the public clamor in some of the snippets of reports that have been coming out? What led to government deciding to set up a committee to to go into JIDA in the first place? I think that I think that once the once the uh, the story broke. And it became clear because look, um, in November of 2012, uh, the president Mahama and cabinet actually looked at Jeddah and the issues around Jeddah. This must have been in the heat of the build-up to elections. So something was put down on paper for discussion and for okay. restructuring Jeddah, okay. but it never came out in the public domain because we were all we were all uh, uh, getting ready to vote. Mm -hmm. um, after that, the, uh, the the story then broke, and. I think government took advantage to come out and, and, and actually 
take whatever they had done previously and say, look, we have already done this. And in order for us to complete, we are setting up a commission of inquiry okay. to be able to do it, which is the president's prerogative. And, nice. he, and he exercised that. So Good. that is that for me is, is what really happened. But they, the government definitely knew about JIDA in November of 2012. So it had in mind a plan to put in a committee like this? I think it had started looking at how it could actually you know, legitimize uh, JIDA and mm. actually do right. it. But w what we're seeing here is we are closing the stable doors mm. after the horse has bolted. Has bolted. Has, so is this an audit report? Or what kind of report is it? Um, I don't think you can call it an audit because an, an audit will be very clear uh, in what it, what it is doing and its findings and its conclusions, and then it will it, it will it, it does not necessarily make recommendations. Okay. But it does the work according to a specific terms of reference. Mm. In this case, the, the 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 committee did have a term of reference, and it stated clearly in the opening uh, part of the of the document mm -hmm. uh, that uh, terms of reference also allows it to make its recommendations as to what should or should not be done. It is entirely up to government to decide whether it takes stuff or not. Mm. So at this stage, that's that's where we are. So what is in the report? What does the report say? <laughs> the, the report, uh, if I should, I can't summarize this report. There are too many issues uh, in there. But the report generally does make it clear that JIDA uh, was set up um, in, in, in such a manner that it cannot be said to have been constituted properly. Uh, this is probably a hindsight report that is looking at all the issues around JIDA and saying that had we known better, we could have fixed this and done it in a different way. Um, and that is what government is trying to do when it issued the second the, the, the report uh, that it is recommending the way forward for JIDA. So, from everything that we have seen, the JEDA report is clearly indicting government itself. And, it, and particularly, the indictment is on the ministers who actually run uh, uh, the Ministry of Youth and Sports at the time, and under whose ambit JEDA should have been, been, been received. Every ministry has programs. Mm -hmm. There's no ministry that doesn't have a program that it is running. Usually, programs are funded separately, either through donor support or joint donor government or something. These programs exist in the ministry and it is the minister's responsibility to make sure that this is done properly. Mm -hmm. So the oversight responsibility for everything that happened in Jeddah rests with the ministers who coordinated it at that time. Mm -hmm. Between 206 and 208, it was run under the, the, the new patriotic party government. Mm -hmm. From 209 to date, it has been an NDC government uh, uh, issue. And I don't want to be partisan, but I think it's important to get the timelines straight. Okay. Okay. Because the NYEP was started by the MPP government as a program to up to to mop up some of the um, the unemployment in the in, in graduate youth. Mm -hmm. It was also in there reported that it was suggested that this be done by the National Security Advisor of the day. At the time. At the time. He suggested this should be done because he perceived that there would be some kind of uh, instability and insecurity when you had such a large number of unemployed uh, uh, graduates. So this is how the whole JIDA uh, egg uh, was, was hatched, was, was hatched uh, in order to be able to do it. And at the time, it was supposed to be a two-year program, and then it would be reviewed and then carried on. Now, when the N uh, NDC government inherited NYEP, it then took on a different form. And the form that we are seeing now is the tail wagging the dog, so that now the service providers who are supposed to be contracted to do certain modules were the ones bringing up the modules and de deciding the terms of the contract. Now, again, we don't have contracts, or we don't have that many contracts in Jeddah. What we have are MOUs, right? memorandums of understanding between two parties. Yet the MOUs are worded in such a way that it to see it looks like as if the benefic the, the service providers are the ones who benefited most significantly from all of this. The the the, the, the concept of having a module mm -hmm. under the NYEP did this predate the NDC? So because I know that the name Jedi itself came up in November last year. November last year. So before that, even within NDC from mm -hmm. 2009, it was called NYEP. NYEP. So the, the idea of modules mm -hmm. and then service providers, mm -hmm. did the report talk about they existing before the the uh, new government came? Yes, that, that was how it was set up. Okay. There were modules that were set up and they were identified specifically for areas which were supposed to quickly absorb the youth 
into getting things done. So originally, the NYEP started with eight modules. Okay. And then it grew over time. And, and, right, and as, as at the moment, the current number we have is 34. Mm -hmm. But there are far more than that. Okay. Let's go one by one. Now, in terms of the principal findings, A, the business case for Jada, as you said, everybody understands why we need a national youth employment program. And the, the idea its existence makes sense. Mm. But it looks like that what the report is saying is that even though the idea is good, the concept was not well formulated from the beginning. This is what he's saying on page four, which is B. Mm -hmm. Under the executive summary, where he says the concept of JIDA, it is the view of the committee that the concept of a specific program to cater for the unemployment needs of the youth is important and consistent and relevant with relevant development policy framework, such as the Ghana Growth and Development Agenda, uh, MDGs, and all those things. Mm -hmm. But what he says that the committee noted design weaknesses related to how beneficiaries would be exited and the nature of the employment to be provided. So the idea is good, yeah. but the vehicle you want to use to implement the idea mm -hmm. is nebulous. It's not well created. Is that what you got from this part? Well, that is that is exactly what this, that, that part says. The uh, the report is not saying that we have uh, a nefarious program that is of no significance. It says that the idea is laudable mm -hmm. because we have a challenge absorbing youth in it. You see, I have a different opinion on it, but my opinion, I, I suppose, let's leave my opinion until yeah. the end. Let but the, the committee says the, re, the, the idea of mm -hmm. a JIDA or an NYP was good. Yes. But the concept was not designed without, without weaknesses. weaknesses. Good. Then they, they come to the first issue, governance. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the governance issues they noted, I'm going to read some of them, ask you whether this is unique to institutions like this. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest problems faced by JIDA is the absence of an appropriate governance framework. This evidently contributed to other system failures. JIDA lacks a legal basis and accordingly, accordingly did not have a board of directors for the needed oversight and strategic direction. This is the situation of JIDA, even though at the inception stage of the program, the need for an oversight body to provide strategic direction was identified. However, a governing board was never appointed, as was the case. Various ministers of youth and sports, the national coordinators of NYEP, and to some extent, the chief directors of Ministry of Youth and Sports were those responsible for providing leadership. The committee observed with great dissatisfaction the lack of commitment on the part of leadership of NYEP to protect the public purse, particularly related to ensuring value for money. So it looks like this was set up to fail because there was no board. Yes. In, <clears throat> in terms of governance purposes. Yeah. The government has a lot of bodies like that, a lot of programs like that. We have mm -hmm. the school feeding program. Mm -hmm. We have the capitation grant and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Are they all like this? No. The, some of them are boards. Th those, a lot of those who probably, if they don't have a board, would have a, they would have a, a, a steering committee. And that steering committee would have clear guidelines and clear parameters of how it's going to operate. So, it, you see, this the problem with this particular this particular wording is that it makes it look like as if the whole thing was done. Nobody was aware that this this was an issue until just recently. But when 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 another government takes over a program from a previous government, when you inherit it, the first thing you're going to do is to go through to make sure you understand very clearly what the mandates of this uh, program is supposed to be and what it is supposed to achieve. When you do that, you should automatically realize that these structural weaknesses, or as the report calls them, systemic weaknesses, are there. So you should address them before you even start expanding the program. Mm. But for some reason, we took it over from a previous government and then we just went with exactly what had been put in place without looking at it and modifying it and correcting anything. And we allowed it to run for four years. Mm. So number one, there was no board. Number two, JIDA is still under governance. He said JIDA generally lacks adequate operational and administrative manuals. You're an accountant. Explain how this works because every time I read audit reports and when auditors talk to me on different programs, they emphasize on what is your administrative manual? What mm -hmm. is your operation mm -hmm. manual? What is that? And why is it important for organizations to have that? Well, basically, it's providing do's and don'ts for the staff who work on the program. So the staff should be very clear that if you do say maybe get a request for payment, looking at it from the accounting side, you get a request for payment, you cannot make that payment until you have maybe two or three signatories. And those titles of who should sign off are very clearly laid out. These guidelines should be there. So the staff do not overstep their boundaries, they do not exceed their capacities, and they are very clear that they also have themselves covered in the event that an, uh, a detailed order should take place. So 
all of these operational and administrative manuals are supposed to be meticulously written out. However, with a program like this that sits in a civil service organization, that sits with the ministry, there are clear guidelines as laid out by the Financial Administrative Act mm -hmm. and the Financial Accounting Regulations. Mm. So if JIDA fell, fell under the Ministry of Youth and Sports, which it did, there should have been guidelines for how it would work. So could, you, that, could, you, could you not have assumed that the ministry under which it fell the ministry's guidelines, because I believe the Ministry of Youth and Sports does have guidelines. The Ministry of Government Youth and Sports, departments have guidelines. They all have guidelines and they fall under the FAA, the Financial Administrative Act, or the FAR, the Financial Accounting Regulations. Mm -hmm. They are guided by that. So that in this case, it should have been made very clear to Jada that their guiding operational and administrative rules are as per the FAA and the FAR. Later on, the report it says very clearly that all of these were ignored. There was no recourse or no reference to the FAA. There was no re because reference it to wasn't the explicitly stated in the beginning that we are working with these financial rules, and therefore somebody can plead innocence in the sense that there was no manual guiding his financial actions. Yes, but you had a minister and a, and two deputy ministers who were actually there and who should have made sure that everything is done according. To ministerial uh, according to government guidelines. You see, you cannot absorb yourself by saying that because nothing was specifically written for JIDA, so we bypassed it or we or we didn't know. Mm. The minister has other programs under his ambit. JIDA is not only the pro the thing, the only program. So the minister the could have questioned or asked. Of okay. course, he just could quickly, have. finally, on job. the governance one. So because of what we just read, because of lack of adequate operational and administrative manuals. There was an extreme focus of power and authority at the top echelons of government governance, resulting in a situation where sometimes deputy national coordinators of JIDA, the MNE team, and regional coordinators were not aware of the modules that had been approved and of which implementation had started. The committee found instances of growing disregard by SPs for regional coordinators who insisted that value for money, especially as there was no formal procedure to enlist their views before projects were renewed or expanded. So essentially, a national coordinator knows something, his deputies don't know. Mm -hmm. Some module may be implemented in my region, mm -hmm. regional coordinator is not aware. Mm -hmm. and, th and this is happening. Yes, and, and, and all it tells you is that down the line, in districts and, 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 uh, and, and municipalities and other areas, programs were running and the minister was, says he's not aware. The minister is claiming, I didn't know about any of this because everything should have come through the ministry who should have signed up on every module before it was implemented. Now, if he wasn't doing this, then you have the confusion that we are seeing where somebody comes up with a module, they decide to implement it in the eastern region, it goes ahead and the minister doesn't have a clue what is going on, except that somebody is able to pay money to the module service providers. Mm -hmm. Now, for you to be able to get money out of government, you cannot do so without a check from the Controller and Accountant General. Before the Controller and Accountant General signs off on a check, he needs instruction from the Office of the Budget or else he needs instruction for the Finance Ministry. Or he will get instruction from higher up. So the instruction to actually pay somebody under a module should come through the ministers requesting a release of funds. We should go to the budget office. We should then go to the Ministry of Finance, Deputy Minister or, or, or the Minister himself, before the Controller and Accountant General will cut you a check. But here we see checks being cut for 50 million CDs plus. And, no, and everybody says, we didn't know about this. Wow. Let me go to the last point under governance. There are concerns among JIDA staff that a senior management staff who doubled as a coordinator of the IRLG's module was reassigned by the former national coordinator after raising concerns that the purported number of persons trained in one of IRLG's report was 300 rather than 5,000, as stated in the report. This tended to create the impression that some SPs are untouchable and also able to remotely manipulate Jida for their wishes to be done. The view is compounded by SPs directly exerting pressure on Jida staff in particular members of the MNE team, to produce reports as the SPs wished in order to receive payments. It is unhealthy for good governance when private companies are able to request government to apportion state resources in a particular manner for their, personal, for their benefit. For instance, in a letter dated 28 April 2011 and 9 January 2012, Mr. Henry Kanga and Mr. Roland Agambere, National Coordinator of Asantaba Cutting Industries and CEO of IRLG respectively, requested that 50% of the communication service tax into bracket talk 
part-time tax be dedicated to the trades and vocation module and the remaining 50% dedicated to the ICT module. Mr. Gambere owns both companies. In effect, Mr. Gambere's demand was for 100% of DDA's allocation of the CST to be dedicated to companies owned by him. The CST is one of the most reliable sources of funding for GDA. Mm. <laughs> but, but that is how we don't need to explain anything. Well, <laughs> we, we, need, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. Is. Bennett, Bennett. We yeah. need to talk around it. We need to talk around it to make a point. You see, um, if Roland Agambiri was able to influence how his payments are made, then he was doing it With on knowledge. the basis that somebody would endorse it when he did it. Somebody would certainly support what he was doing. And so he went forward with confidence to get this done. Um, this, this part of it is an example of what happened. But how, how, how do you get a fund like the talk time fund, which is specifically and statutorily defined as to what it should be used for, to be diverted to support a program of this sort, which is clearly not under its mandate? or clearly does, is not supposed to be funded. Mm. But later on in the report, you will see that cabinet actually decided where the sources of funding should come for JIDA. Cabinet actually decided that, okay, and went ahead to implement it. The report also particularly says that the District Assembly's Common Fund was one of the most used funds to support JIDA. Now, the DACF is very, very clearly not for the purpose, but it was used for the purpose. The thing that we need to ask is, there is a common fund administrator who knows very, very clearly what his job is. He's very clear. He now has his mandate. And over time, Parliament has instructed that the DACF, the fund, should be used for other purposes. For example, there's the HIPIC element in it, which comes from HIPIC, which, sorry, that's not, nothing to do with the DACF. But there's the MP's share of the District Assembly Common Fund, which was brought in. I think it's about uh, one and a half or two percent that was mm. included in the funds that should be allocated to MPs for for district development. So okay. that got parliamentary approval, mm -hmm. and the DACF releases that money periodically. But in this particular case, for the DACF to release the money, you neither need parliamentary approval or you need a constitutional change of what the DACF is supposed to be for. But somehow, somehow, we were able to authorize the district fund administrator to pay out monies to the JIDA program without recourse to, to this, parliament to and without recourse to the AG's department. Very interesting. I, I still want to run through because there's a lot. I don't want to spend too much time on one. So listen, first we've gone through uh, the concept of JIDA and the need for JIDA. There were issues. They were gone through governance. Now I am on human resource management. I'll spend a few seconds reading some of the stuff there. Then I'll go to the actual financial issues and the procurement issues. So this is page 5D. GIDA does not have clearly defined HRM policies. As a result, recruitment, placement of personnel, promotion and performance management do not follow best practice from 2006. In addition, a number of the personnel did not present valid certificate during the mainstreaming exercise, supervised by PSC in 2012 as part of a restructuring activities that were therefore and were therefore not interviewed. Placement in positions at the head office, regional office, and district offices as a result were not based on qualification, experience, or competence. Cronyism and political patronage were reported as existing from the inception of NYEP, and these factors negatively affected institutional performance. Two, DIDA does not have an adequate system to regulate the orderly allocation of duties and responsibilities and monitoring of performance. Information flow and feedback among top management personnel, as well as the generality of staff at the head office, in the offices of the region and district were highly unsatisfactory. GIDA lacks a staff appraisal system. This has partly resulted in the absence of defined reward and sanction system. Typically, this leads to an environment where staff think that the work does not pay off and poor service go unpunished. Consequently, anything goes, and there is little or no motivation to deliver quality service to GIDA's ultimate clients, the beneficiaries. Finally, a close examination of the qualifications and experience of the current members of the management team revealed that some of them did not have the requisite qualification for appointment to the positions they were encumbering. There was at least one instance where certificates utilized by management team member, Mr. Topsaba Al-Hassan, to gain employment were found to be fake. The committee recommends to the case to the Office of the Attorney General 
for necessary action. Let's talk about this briefly. So, no proper human resource management, chronism in appointments, anything goes because there's no staff appraisal system, people using fake certificates. This doesn't seem too new, does it? Come in, yeah, in Israel, yeah, yes, 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 briefly on, on this I, one. I think that this point is actually a continuation from the lack of governance. Now, if there was any proper governance, there would have been <laughs> certain parameters set to ensure that processes were in place and the right people were hired. Now, without a process, anything goes. So I'm not surprised that off the back of this, we're seeing cronyism and people being employed without certificates. God knows how many people were even employed and had anything on their file. But, but guys, look at the way the commit the report links it to and analyzes it in paragraph. The last part, one paragraph, it says, mm -hmm. typically this leads to an environment where staff think that hard work does not pay off and poor services go unpunished. Mm -hmm. Consequently, anything goes mm -hmm. and there is little or no motivation to deliver quality service to the ultimate client, the beneficiary. This looks like this, this could be any state institution actually. It, it is, is an example of a lot of our state institutions. It is, it is actually a, a reflection of something that I could probably say is a national phenomenon. Because we see time and time again in a lot of the public institutions and now in most private, uh, some certain private quarters, where hard work is hardly uh, rewarded and there are no structures in place to ensure people are motivated to do their work. People hobnob with the right people and then they make their rise to the top. So when you have a situation where people feel unappreciated you're going to breed despondency despondency will obviously will then you know so so the governance issues led to the human resource problems we are seeing absolutely. which then led to poor performance and poor service delivery but for me i also tend to look at it from the birthing angle now when it was born from nyep i think that to those at the grassroots a message was sent out that this is what we were going to use to help our people. Mm -hmm. So when subsequently it started growing to where it, certain things needed to be put in place, like a board or an oversight committee or a steering committee to make sure that the proper people got in, people closed their eyes deliberately because if you allow these things to be put in, then you cannot allow for your friend in the village who supported you during the elections or your foot soldiers to come in there because those people have not had the requisite qualifications, mm -hmm. they are not as educated as need be, and will not have the capability to execute properly mm. so that this thing will be done in the manner that right. it should be done. Just final comment on this. Isn't it surprising that so far, the first person who, has, who has been recommended for AG is the person who got a job with a fake certificate. <laughs> so that's the first person whose name has been mentioned, mm -hmm. Mr. Al Hassan. So let's move on quickly. Now we are on page six. Yes. It talks about funding JIDA. Now, the first point is receives receipts and expensive borrowing. Listeners, this is City Breakfast Show. We are taking you through JIDA, giving you a sense of what is in the report. I urge you to actually get the full report and read it because there's so many details we can't go into because the report is so voluminous. I'm here with Sidney Case, Leifold, Inshira Ado, and Godfrey uh, Akutubuafu. Now, here's it. JIDA receives funding directly from a consolidated fund, as you said, mm -hmm. and other statutory sources such as GET Fund, NHIS Fund, Road Fund, and Communication Service Tax. These statutory funds were set up by various legislations to meet specific objectives. Funding allocation by Parliament for JIDA from sources such as DACF without the requisite amendment of Article 252 of the 1992 Constitution and Act 455 amounts to breach of Article 252 of the 1992 Constitution and Act 455 establishing the DACF. This is a dereliction of duty on the part of Parliament, the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, and the Administrator of the District Assembly Common Fund. The table below shows government's financial support with JIDA between 2009 and 2013. Get Fund, 8 million in 2009, 6 million in 2010, 19.3 million in 2011, 14.6 million in 2012, totaling 47 million Ghana CDs from Get Fund. <coughs> NHIS, total. a total of 35.5 million after the three years. Mm -hmm. This is Assembly Common Fund, 412 million, 872,000. Communication Service Tax, 182 million, 986. Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning, 270 million, 311,000. The total amount of money transferred from NHIS, DACF, GetFund, CSD, and MOFEP 
to JIDA between 2009 and 2012 is 949,661,000. Actually, approximately 950 million Ghana cities. So this is 500,000 short of a billion. Yeah. Good. Now, it goes on to break down. As shown in the table, almost 950 million cities have been expended on NYEP. In addition, based on figures available as of June 30, 2013, provided by the finance department of JIDA, JIDA was indebted to the tune of 259 million Ghana cities, about 47% or 120, 1, 122 million Ghana cities is owed to Better Ghana Management Services. And um, sorry, the committee. Let me go. Let me go through this again. In addition, based on figures as of June 30, 2013, provided by the finance department of JIDA, JIDA is indebted to the tune of 259 million Ghana cities. About 47% or 122 million is owed to Better Ghana Management Services. The committee observes that at its inception, some management members of JIDA resisted the Ghana, the Better Ghana Management Services engagement. A fair estimate shows that, given the pre-financing nature of the arrangement with Better Ghana, JIDA is paying financing costs of about 100% per month interest, hmm. or 120,200% per annum. The committee observes with concern that government with all its spending power should be borrowing at such high interest rate of 120,000% per year. The committee believes that with the right level of financial planning, Jija should be able to borrow from elsewhere at 50% or at worst. The committee found that Jida lacks the requisite structures and systems to effectively manage the amount of national resources it receives as a result of several factors militating against effective management. There are so many issues here. Excuse me. Break it down. So many issues. About four issues in this it's, whole thing I've read. It's, it's, it's clearly creative corruption. This, this, is, this, is, what, this is what we have here. They, they, they have found a way. Uh, and when I say they, I'm talking about all those involved, the service providers, the government, the, uh, the, uh, the national coordinator and, and ministers, have discovered a creative way of using public, the public money. I am boggled because in all my years of working as an auditor and as a financial analyst, I have never ever seen uh, such, you know, a height of corruption. Uh, in, in my career for you to for you to actually take a program and, and look at what we I mean this is this is the crux of the matter the national health insurance scheme has been struggling to pay its service providers on time and and there have been many instances where we have come to crisis point where others have tried to go on strike and and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and withdraw services to patients and we <clears> have <throat> taken 35.5 million out of the fund over the over the four years in in, in, in their case over three years mm -hmm. I mean why why do you even do this because end of the day the NHIS is a pro poor support system where we are trying to guarantee health for all our underprivileged and you take that money out and put it into another program for which you have no defined end results so the whole idea that somebody would actually approve payment of that nature from out of a fund that is so critical to the survival of the, of the underprivileged to put it into a supposed poverty reduction program. It doesn't make any sense. Then JIDA must be very powerful to get NHIS, District Assembly Common Fund, and CST to all contribute. It means that the person who is in charge of JIDA must be a very powerful person because how and because as, you, as we read, mm -hmm. the laws establishing the GET Fund, mm -hmm. the District Assembly yes. Common Fund, yes. did not mention JIDA. You're as well. So if you, you want to divert funds from these sources to JIDA, mm -hmm. you must go through parliament. You must go through parliament, parliament didn't get approval. Mm -hmm. There's a local government ministry, there's a minister for communication, mm -hmm. there's a minister for youth and employment. Mm -hmm. So within those ministries, mm -hmm. they decided to break the law by nobody putting... Spoke up. And, and nobody questioned the money coming. Nobody questioned the money coming, but I, uh, there's, there's, there's some wording here that suggests that parliament actually did get involved. Um, and I says... And, and the report says this is a dereliction of duty on the part of Parliament. They didn't do the their work. The of local government and the administration. And, and, and if Parliament did not do it, um, you see, you can Parliament can only act when you have it when they have a bill in front of them or something to consider. 
So they cannot go on, they just cannot go out there fishing for something which they That's think right. they want to legislate. So somebody should have put it before parliament. And who should have done that? It should have been cabinet because we cannot have a private member's bill or we do not have access to a private member's bill in this country. So the only people who bring a bill before Parliament is cabinet. Absolutely. For me, the creativity used in stealing the people's money through DIDA is inversely related to the various attempts by the Ministry of Finance to raise revenue for the country. Look at the setup of, 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 of DIDA and how much money we should have gone towards dealing and plugging holes that have caused a lot of national pain. It has been at the Test of all kinds of different things. Mm. You've had people agitating because look at the look, hold on. The national Let, health insurance, for example. <clears throat> hold on there. I want to ask another quick question before we go in there. There, there are two issues on the the the, uh, the, 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 the what I just read. There's the fact that monies were paid into Jida from sources which were not approved to but, do so. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is the first issue. Then the second issue is the indebtedness of Jida. So Jida was given nine hundred and fifty. Million, million series. Yet Jida owes another two hundred two fifty million to Better Ghana Management Services, which creation was contentious, mm -hmm. and then one twenty two million series to another institution. And then they are saying that their loans or the Jida's indebtedness is the tune of about hundred percent interest per month. So if, in breaking that down, if Jida goes to borrow a thousand series mm -hmm. from Better Ghana, Jida then has to pay a thousand series a month. An extra thousand so, a thou and the interest rate we're running with in Ghana hmm. is below 50 percent, and we haven't complained about that rate. So, isn't there any law that regulates what interest you charge? There is, or is it a, is it a, is it a commercial thing? So, you can just go and ask. there is, there, there, there is a law as to how much. In fact, before government even goes to go and borrow money with a program like this, it should have gone to parliament. Okay. They should have gone to parliament. So that the, 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 the rate of interest will be agreed will be by agreed, parliament. Of course. And if you take if you took this to parliament and anybody, and I pray that it will be both majority and minority committee would look at this and say, what? We're going to borrow money at 100% a month? No way. What won't are do we doing? Okay. We won't do it. So this clearly bypassed the, the, uh, the, the system. Could this qualify as an economic crime? This is an economic crime of oh. gargantuan proportions. Plain so, uh, that it, it, okay, so let's move on. Let's leave people to uh, decide. Let's go to item two under the same uh, financial issues. This is called inadequacy, inadequate capacity of the CFO. Let me do some of that. Yes, go. So, read for me. The inadequate capacity the of the CFO. CFO, the Deputy National Coordinator Finance, the most senior finance person in GDA, has no track record as a competent head of finance. Indeed, the CFO admits he lacks the competency, training, and experience to operate effectively as head of finance. Accordingly, he's not able to bring best practices to bear on GDA in terms of demonstrating financial responsibility, transparency, accountability, and ethical conduct, and financial resource management. The DNC finance did not seem to have full visibility of payments made to SPs as well as the obligations of GDA and their various MOUs. This lack of adequate capacity in the finance unit affected the financial governance environment of GDA and, and introduced various risks, such as one, inability to supervise the operations of the ADB, Agricultural Development Bank, and relevant rural banks to effectively mitigate the risk of siphoning of state funds at the district level. Documentation reviewed by the committee revealed allegations of complicity in the unauthorized opening of bank accounts in the name of GDA at the district level. Mm -hmm. This facilitated the unauthorized withdrawal of unclaimed beneficiary allowances through the unauthorized operation of accounts at the district level. A case in point was the opening of account number 660 operated at the Agona branch of Confanoti Rural Bank in the Asante region to withdraw 23,473 Ghana CDs. There was also an attempt to transfer 120,000 Ghana CDs into an account number 123 at the Pankrono branch of the same rural bank. Good. Two, inadequate cost benefit analysis of contract sums to ensure that there was value for money of contracts with SPs, as in the case of BGMS and Zoom Lion Ghana Limited. Mm -hmm. Three, budgeting and monitoring of actual performance against budget allocation is virtually non existent, thereby overlooking an important responsibility to planning and making decisions for the future. The absence of effective planning has also resulted in a passive signing of contracts and disbursement of resources. Indeed, it will appear that GDA does not have a means of adequately reviewing its transactions to provide a clear route for achieving its aims and targets. 
and targets. It also lacks the ability to monitor and control income and expenditure during the budget period. Mm. Four, GDA does not regulate. GDA does not regularly prepare financial statements monthly, quarterly, or annually. You are receiving nine hundred million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> How do you handle a billion, a billion, a billion CDs, Ghana CDs, a billion CDs, and you don't report? Go on. Yes, accordingly, the committee did not see a summary of funds received and how they were expended, for instance, on an annual basis. Five, GDA does not have a system, whether manual, spreadsheet, or an accounting software, to record all transactions and to be able to understand what the records mean. GDA cannot boast of a recording system that could produce a record that is both complete and accurate, thus capturing all transactions correctly, arithmetically, to facilitate the financial audit process. And then six says, uh, there is evidence that a series of payments were authorized and made without the knowledge of the head of finance. Wow. So this is still under the issue of uh, inadequate capacity of the CFO. Yeah. And then let me let me just so so not, not only was he not only was he an incompetent uh, uh, qualified CFO. accountant, but he also sat there and they run rings around him. Making payments without him even knowing it, which so he didn't even know payments were being made. Which doesn't need which doesn't need an accounting background. He just needs common sense. And the payments couldn't be tracked as well. Couldn't be. There was tracked. no financial reports being prepared. None. But if, no quarterly reports. But if a government agency is giving monies in the size that we are talking about yeah. to Jida, mm -hmm. isn't it, how often are state agencies supposed to prepare annual reports? Is it just once a year or monthly or anything? No, you're supposed to. You're supposed every month. You're supposed to prepare your request for cash uh, uh, funding okay. from the Office of Budget Management. Mm -hmm. So every month you're supposed to go and get your allocation of money. So you do that every year. But every quarter you're supposed to file your returns. So government can incorporate it into the national accounts and then publish that uh, for the public. So every three months you're supposed to have some kind of a report. This run for four years, mm. five years, six years. Nothing. Go for Finish with the inadequate financial <clears throat> oversight, and then we'll go, go to, to the procurement. procurement. That is where no, the... I, I wanted to end the financial oversight okay. quickly. All right. Then. So, so the committee found that there was inadequate oversight of financial matters. This is evidenced by the absence of an audit report implementation committee or audit committee or any similar arrangement on internal audit function at GIDA. This is the situation, even though the Ministry of Youth and Sports is involved in financial decisions, especially with respect to procuring XPs. The Auditor General's report on GIDA made significant findings on GIDA, but there is no evidence of attempts to implement the recommendations. MOY, as that is the Ministry of Youth and Sports, plays no further role with respect to independent and unbiased reviews and checks. As a result, there were inadequate efforts to ensure that transactions were effected in a manner to enable GDA's objectives to be realized. Additionally, some contractual conditions and performance measures were not adequately met, and payment to SPs were not done after checks to ensure that those payments were actually in respect of beneficiaries who actually benefited from the program. So that ends the inadequate financial oversight. Now, listeners, let me just explain why we are proceeding this way. You see, one of the, the, the pillars of democracy is good governance. Now, one of the factors that encourage good governance is awareness. There's something we call social accountability. A lot of things happen in our country, and because people are unaware, they make very unguarded statements, and they, they take very poor decisions. Now, the reason why we are on air is to use our privileged position to share the information with you. Now. Admittedly, this data report is very large, but what we are trying to do is to break it down for those of you who cannot read or those of you who don't have the time to read to appreciate the various issues. So we've gone through the governance issues, we've gone through the financial issues. There are other aspects of the report that we would have to serialize because there's a lot in the report. And for you to appreciate the full report, um, I don't want to rush to just push every information out because I think this thing must be digested well. So we are still on the financial side and that's where we are focusing for today because when we get to the procurement and contracting side, I, I, I bet you it will take another full radio show to hmm. go through the procurement and I am dedicating airtime to do that throughout the week. So let's not rush too much. I want us to comment on the financial oversight issues and then let's take a couple of quick interviews before we move on, because I know Godfrey is really wanting to go into the meat. <laughs> oh yeah. Because yeah. The, if you if you to, if you think about it, 
the real meat of Jida is not just the financial impropriety, but it's actually the procurement and the contracting. The contracting. That's where a lot of the meat is. The looting. That's yes, where the that's, looting where it took, that's where the looting took place. But we are just dealing with just the financial issues here. And even that on its own is scary. I mean, Sydney, the, I don't know what you can say about the inadequate financial oversight. It's not too strange if you mm. think about it because mm. I was here with you a couple of weeks ago. We went through the audit reports of 2011 or yeah. so mm -hmm. and it was, it was the same. So we can't really fall Jida that much because almost all MDAs have the same issue of lack of financial oversight. Yes. So maybe we should all go back to do accounting 101 and do maybe, I don't know, because it looks like we, we can't say Jida is unique when it comes to inadequate financial oversight. Can't we? we can't. No, we can't. In fact, JIDA is very typical of financial accounting oversight. Now, we like to think that if you have a, a qualified accountant as a as controller, mm -hmm. then it, it would automatically fix the problem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. what, 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 we, what we have here is a clear decision uh, to not go according to the, the, uh, the, the regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm which we have. So you, you don't, first of all, you don't have a qualified accountant. So there's no professional integrity in what he was doing. He was doing what needed to be done based on some spreadsheet. There, there, there was a spreadsheet or two. What the report is saying is that even though there were some numbers, they couldn't really tie those numbers into anything uh, real. So they discredit those, those numbers that were given. Mm -hmm. we, we are faced with a very, very serious problem. Mm -hmm. And that one is clearly itemized in the financial oversight. Okay. One, your, your, your CFO is incapable mm -hmm. of putting in any control procedures. The, the, the quality of bringing a CFO to bear is that he actually knows what needs to be put in place in terms of control procedures to ensure integrity of his figures. One. Two, there is also very, very clearly a situation where other people could actually get checks to be authorized and, and, and paid out without even the financial controller knowing about it. His authority is diminished and somebody else is triggering a payment, which means that we are not going according to the accounting regulations and the, and, 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 and the, and the administration uh, mm. of, 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 the, uh, of the program. Now, you can't, you can't do worse than that. This is a free-for-all. Okay? It's a free-for-all because it is very clear that the service providers could come to, the, to, to JIDA come and demand a payment, and the payment actually gets done, if not by the CFO, by somebody else, above and around the CFO. Mm. So the CFO is not the end result. His, his, his authorization must always go up to somebody else, and in this case, it will be to a deputy minister or to the minister under which he reports before we trigger a payment. But something very, very convoluted has happened here. Mm. Okay, let me talk to Dr. Nimoy Thompson. Listeners, we're talking JIDA. The report is voluminous. It's in front of us this morning. Today, we are just going through the financial side and we'll start, actually, we'll touch on the procurement issues also before we close. But what I'm saying is that there's a lot in this report that a, a one radio show cannot adequately exhaust if it is to be meaningful. Now, Dr. Nimoy Thompson is an economist and um, he's done a lot of work with international agencies that have tried to help deal with governance issues. Doc, thanks for joining the program. I'm not too sure if you've read the full report or if you've just caught the snipers we've been discussing. Have you managed to go through the whole JIDA report? Well, I went through the, uh, the draft report, which you said this morning really isn't that much different from the final. I suppose they've added something to it. But based on what I've listened uh, so far, uh, at least those portions that we've discussed so far are the same as those that appeared in the, the draft. So I'm pretty much familiar with, with, with the issues at stake. Besides also being familiar with the background, all the efforts actually that went into the formation of the National Youth Employment Program. Uh, uh, in fact, that started with there should have been certain other uh, events before it was implemented. But I wanted to talk about a couple of issues. One is the name itself, the, the JIDA, how we moved from NYEP to Ghana Youth Employment and Entrepreneurial Development Agency. As you know, I've had problems with that fragment, that aspect of the name, Entrepreneurial Development Agency. It's, it's completely wrong in the first place, and it's embarrassing. It, appropriately, it, we should retain the name 
it should be entrepreneurship development. Oh, this one, what's that? Not entrepreneurial. <laughs> so so they each commit different. Ah, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, but that is yeah, the yeah, yeah, that's the thing that I happen to. Oh, yeah, he has a point. What is the point of that? It's a very scandalous point. We can actually go back to NYEPS. NYEPS was quite a new one. Obviously, it has its own imperfection. You know, we are not going to. It also has certain strengths that I believe that we could have. Elaborated upon the whole issue of creating Nigeria in order to complete an entrepreneurship development element, for instance. But, Doc, 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 hold on. On, on that point, I'm not too sure how crucial it is in the sense that the name Jida itself was, 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 was brought about November last year. But if you look at the period we're dealing with, 2009 to 2013, where these disbursements were made, it was still National Youth Employment Program. So the name appears to even be an afterthought but the, the challenge the, the issues we are dealing with for example if you go to the report it talks about the concept of a jida or an nyep and the fact that it was recommended by a national security person who thought that if we didn't create something like this for the teaming unemployed youth we could have a national crisis on our hands and even though that was done there were design weaknesses from the beginning so I, i'm not too sure if the problems we are discussing have to do with the way the name change impacted the the the, the 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 scheme it's more to do with setting up a vehicle for which you don't have a real proper dis designation of what the vehicle will do being the genesis of all the problems that we are discussing now more than just a change of name strategies for addressing youth unemployment in africa so the, the national security was only one contribution and as a result of the water living declaration we were actually supposed to have a uh, a national employment, presidential employment summit. I happen to be one of those who actually did the background to this for that. Unfortunately, it didn't come on. And the, the youth unemployment problem, of course, persisted. So the whole idea of NYEP then, which, uh, and I have with me here the Youth Employment Implementation Guidelines, and then in parentheses, they have Ghana Youth Core Program. That was the official name. NYEP was kind of an informal, and eventually became core. The whole idea was that it would be a stopgap measure. It would be a temporary initiative to deal with youth unemployment. Ultimately, we were supposed to come up with the national employment policy, and it's stated clearly in the guidelines itself, along with the national uh, youth uh, uh, development policy, and of course, all situated within a national uh, development strategy. Unfortunately, these things took way too long. For instance, the the national employment policy went through six different ministers before it was eventually signed last year. So it beyond the issues of financial money, there are institutional issues also. The, the mere sense of a lack of urgency in tackling certain issues. A single policy document going through six, at least, I counted six, it's probably more, before it was eventually signed. And even though it was signed and seen, it seems to have been put aside. So my own recommendation is that forget about this Gita thing. Go back to the NYEP framework and build upon the strength because they have a lot of strength. If you go through the implementation guidelines alone, it raises a push for very good uh, uh, suggestions. There are weaknesses also. Since you're talking about the financial management of the thing, let me just share with you, uh, and this is just one paragraph from, from the uh, implementation guidelines. It says financial management. The Ministry of Manpower, Youth and Employment, together with the National Employment Task Force and other collaborating ministries, will have overall responsibility for the financial management of the program. Standard accounting and financial reporting procedures will be applied in managing the financial resources of the program at all levels. Various accounting and financial records will also be available for auditing purposes as and when required. Care should be taken to ensure that the under-mentioned key functions. He's trying to say that if they are going back to the original thing they plan to do, this will never happen. But I want to contest that to say differentiate between institutional weakness and deliberate crime. That's why we need to go to the FAA Financial Administration Act and so forth and so on, and then. No, so you you are you are no, 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 hold on hold on. Mm. Policy, especially as uh, 
this basically means uh, a situation where portions of, of uh, government revenue are set aside as a matter of policy or law for specific programs. And over the years, long before even when NYDP was set up, this has been the bane of fiscal policy now because lots of money was put in the road fund, get fund, this other fund, and whatnot. At the end of the fall, very little was left for actual discretionary spending, uh, especially well, yeah. in capital expenditures and so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. In the case of NYDP, mm-hmm. there was something like 10 or 12 different earmarked funds. No, no, so, for instance, no, 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 one of the funds that could have been addressed. You said for the 2012 version of the <laughs> Now, earlier you also talked about the, the lack of a board. They actually had something, uh, that, for lack of a better term, you can actually call a board, which was named the National Employment Task Force. And it's quite interesting the composition, which includes the Office of President, Ministry of Manpower. So it goes on and on and on. It has about 12, 15 different members. Doc, do, hello, hello, Doc. D- hello, Doc. Yes, I'm just trying to get some clarity. So you're suggesting that if what was originally planned based on the work that had been done earlier had been followed, the nebulous nature of this creature called GIDA or NYEP wouldn't have been as nebulous as it is and therefore a lot of the problems we are discussing this morning wouldn't have emerged. Is that is, is that correct? Good. Okay. But... Mm-hmm. Mm. Fine. Uh, yeah, yes, Doc. Mm. All right. Good. And then it was taken to the spot. So even then, there was there, there was this Hello, where do you know? politics going on. Hello. Some of the some of the stuff that yes. ideally oh, it should be situated at the Ministry of Employment because the Ministry of Sports really has no uh, institutional capacity or even the mandate to deal with employment issues. The fact that the Ministry of Employment is to the Ministry of Youth uh, uh, and Employment mandate. It should have been at the ministry, and I would recommend that it should be taken back to the ministry of Would it be something like that? Because they really don't know what. But what friend? What friend? Other than the word you just deploying, I mean, appearing in there. Media text them out. And even then, even then, if it should be taken to the ministry of employment, we should then. And I'm a friend. The number, the number, zero two zero four, zero two four four, zero two four four. The employment creation will come from nine two generally, which. Your, your the angle you're bringing, but can we not say that this, notwithstanding the fact that we didn't follow what was initially planned, notwithstanding that we must differentiate between um, institutional weakness that leads to financial in a, uh, impropriety and deliberate breaking of laws? Because if you look at, for example, four state agencies gave monies to youth NYEP or JIDA without parliamentary approval or change in the laws. So you have the Communication Service Tax, you have the Digital Assemblies Common Fund, you have the NHIS, and then you have the GET Fund, all giving substantial amounts to a certain NYEP. And then you have all the concomitant financial lack of administration, and then the, the procurement issues. I mean, couldn't this be an excuse? The, the point is that no matter how poorly you are set up, you can't deliberately break the law and borrow at a 1,200 interest rate. I mean, even people who run their own companies would not do that. So I, I think you, you ought to differentiate between challenges of establishment and issues of how the, the concept was designed versus people's deliberate decisions to do the wrong thing and to essentially commit financial crimes. Yes, precisely. You use the term institutional weaknesses. 
The people are simply taking advantage of the institutional weaknesses that they've encountered at Jinta. And after, the, after going through the report, the imagery I found was that of what sometimes you see on the guy, one thing I think will pass a whole place. You know what? We will continue with the procurement part tomorrow. It is too heavy. Yes, let's, 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 let's do a preview because otherwise, if we do everything today, the, the, the government wants us to just do it today and forget. So tomorrow, we'll come back to Jida and do procurement. So we will announce the show. We are serializing it. Jida is only one aspect. I mean, if we've been following the pack here, look at the impunity with which people dissipate or misappropriate public resources. It's, it's simply unbelievable. So it's a bigger issue. Let's hope that the bit then set an opportunity for us to not just Hello? perform the Jida on it or The guy will call you. If we do that, if we go in and do just that, yes, we that's good that, answer. He'll uh, call you. Give him some money uh, to. Uh, to the transportation is the is you know, you 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 so I think there should be an opportunity for a comprehensive public sector reform. All right. We cannot do anything. We can we can talk about GDA all we want. Unless we have these reforms that will ultimately translate into efficient utilization of resources, GDA or no GDA. You can close GDA today. The waste is going to show up somewhere else. All right. Thank you very much for your perspective, Dr. Nimoy Thompson, an economist who tries to trace the history of this and says that they were clearly spelled out guidelines for financial management indeed if we had stuck to the original plan in his in what he's saying some of these may not have happened but let's try and sum up quickly on the the financial issues because there are lots of paragraphs on procurement which we haven't even touched on go for it how big is the procurement side this is from uh, f on page eight and it has how much information are we looking at when it talks about procurement and contracting we are looking at a considerable volume of uh information Bernard because here we have specifics with regards to who got what okay those who under declared those who over declared mm -hmm. falsified reports falsified claims okay so that's a lot a so lot, so Cindy so yeah. just give me your final comment on the financial side and then we'll touch on the procurement briefly and then continue later the fact that there was no framework the fact that there was no compliance with the uh, financial accounting administration act and the uh, regulations the fact that no clear no clear leadership was put in place at some point in the report it talks about how the minister of Fin the minister of youth actually assigned the chief director of his ministry <clears throat> to take full charge of the general program but nothing seems to have come out of it so all of these weaknesses in mm -hmm. the structure and the setup of Jeddah have led to this massive but I think we should, we should relate this B both of us have been analyzing our economy seriously we yeah. were talking about the GDP uh, the, sorry the 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 budget deficit 12.3 mm -hmm. percent yes government has a huge financial hole to fill mm -hmm. now let's go back to the figures in 2012 yeah because we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are talking about a deficit in 2012 get fund paid 14.6 million CDs mm -hmm. to Jida. Yeah. NHIS paid 21 million CDs to Jida. Ghana CDs. Mm -hmm. This is Assembly Common Fund paid seven, Some, 117 million. million CDs to Jida. Communication Service Tax paid 76 million to Jida. And Finance Ministry itself, the overseer of the public purse, <laughs> paid the biggest 219 million to Jida. Now, in, in the reasoning that the finance ministry gave us for the deficit, the number one reason was the spending on um, salaries. salaries and the, 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 the what's the name of single spine salary. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the 2012 figures, you have almost 450 million Ghana CDs paid to Jida. Yes. How significant is this figure in terms of the budget deficit? Um, the budget deficit. Uh, in 2012 was pegged at about uh, 7.6 billion okay. um, and that was a drift from the supplementary budget of 2.6 there about so it's about 4, 4 billion uh, over the top in 2012 now uh, if it's 4 billion then it's like one eighth 
This is one eighth. One eighth of, of it. But it is significant because it wasn't budgeted. All these okay. things, monies given to Jida were not budgeted. All these budgets, all these, the, 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 the only monies that would have been budgeted was the allocations to the statutory funds, the GET fund, the NHIS, the DACF, etc., etc. And those, those institutions didn't budget to give this they amount to Jida. Exactly. So what we have done now is we have shorted those institutions and put the money into Jida. All right? Now, I, the I, question we haven't asked is if we put all that money into Jida and Jida has not been able to account and Jida still for owes. how Jida still owes and it can't account for how it used the money adequately and yet there are certain private sector companies who have been paid huge sums of money and in this case the RLG, Agambiri Group and the uh, and the, uh, uh, the Zoom Lion, the, the Zoom Lion, the Zoom Lion uh, group have been paid these massive amounts of money. Then all we have done is we have taken budget. We have actually paid money to these particular institutions. So we have taken, we have all, actually allocated budgetary resources to pay to individuals, individual and individual companies, and they have benefited from all of this. Lacks of control and lacks of oversight in financial management, which we are now seeing. Now that that makes it a very, very significant amount of money. It makes it significant because if you take 450 million, say in the light of the budget deficit, it's not it's not a lot. But when you have a deficit, that's a lot. It's, it's one eighth it's one of eight. the budget deficit. And Absolutely. so that you are saying there are two things. There's one of depriving these different institutions, get fund, NHS, DACF, CST, mm -hmm. MOFEP, what the original use of the money, would, the money have been, would have been. That's yes. number one. Yep. And number two, you put it in a basket full of holes, which yes. is called Jeddah. Yes. So if we are talking about one eighth of our budget deficit. 1.25%. It's still a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's a significant of, amount of money. And, and, and the significance of all of this is, now that we have got a shortfall in budget, which we, we, we are struggling we are struggling to fix. Your service providers who are supposed to have been supporting other statutory or being supported by other statutory funds, take the NHIS for example, there are so many vendors who have provided services to the NHIS and who are owed money. Or they, they are paid in sort of arrears. So they, they, well, they could be they maybe they'll clear June and then there's like three months arrears. You could say kind of you could call it paid in arrears, but you could also call it say that these these uh, those particular service providers have pre financed government expenditure. Exactly. And yet that money has been diverted and paid to the, the Agambiri and the uh, and the RLG uh, the RLG group. And, and, and to okay. the so far we haven't said heard too much about these groups except for the fact that the RLG CEO was able to ask for certain payments we made. Godfrey, give us a teaser of what is yeah, happening tomorrow. Oh, yeah, because in, uh, with the financial side is quite clear. Let's you know, go to procurement and contract. Give us some gist of what let is happening. Let me give you a gist there. Now, Sydney made reference to the absence of contracts and the presence of MOUs. And this is where the MOUs were particularly of great significance. Now, it says the MOUs that were signed contain provisions in breach of the 1992 constitution and legislation such as the Financial Administration Act, and uh, that's uh, Act uh, 654. 654. Mm -hmm. That says, for instance, several MOUs, especially those in connection with Agam's group of companies, including including RLG, CraftsPro, and Asongtaba, contain interest-free loans granted and disbursed to the SPs without recourse to Parliament, as required by the constitution and the Financial Administration Act. There is no evidence that any of these loans granted by JIDA received approval by Parliament. As of 30th June 2013, total loans advanced to the companies owned by Mr. Rulad Agambire stood at approximately 50 million Ghana cities. The committee observes with concern that these companies assert that JIDA owes them about 56 million Ghana series. Mm. That is the first part. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 you see, <clears throat> I am, I am at pain. I am at pain to, 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 to hold this down. At the, at, at the, at the end of the day, you have memorandum of understandings, which are not contracts. Mm -hmm. And we have used those MOUs to actually pay these people. Mm. All right. Which means that the, the contracts that were supposed to go to the Attorney General's Department or pass through Parliament were bypassed. That's right. Now, I still maintain that the only way that you can get a check out of the Controller and Accountant General has got to be through a system that comes through the Ministry of Finance. That's right. So, 
if they are if they were able to, to, to bypass this and actually make payments under MOUs to all these companies, somebody has to question under whose authority did the controller and accountant general, the it's district the assembly house. common fund administrator, the NHIS fund administrator, and all of these people and the get fund. Mm -hmm. Under whose authority did they make the payments? Right. It is a con complete breach of constitutional you know, rules. And possibly a demonstration of someone having all of these people at their hest. That is an implication that we have to make as we go the forward, which we have to assume yeah. that somebody in a powerful position, mm -hmm. somebody whose authority, whose signature, all right, could trigger a payment bypassing the financial accounting regulations is part of this whole mess and that right. person's name Listen, is not mentioned. We, we, as we as will concerned. end today on this no, note. Let's, let's give you one more. One more one. on the procurement. Just there are, there are about 20 yeah, paragraphs of plenty. The first one. Okay. It says, um, it is legitimate to expect that getting value for money from contracts, especially those with SPs, would have attracted utmost attention, especially in the prevailing economic environment where reducing costs and conserving cash should be a priority. It is the view of the committee that several contracts signed by the Ministry of Youth and Sports with SPs are fraught with value leakages, commercial inefficiencies, and waste. For instance, one, as Ontaba is yet to equip beneficiaries trained under the dressmaking model two years ago in the Western region, master trainers have also not been paid, even though as Ontaba has been fully paid 43,390,000 Ghana cities for the service. Similar cases were uncovered in several of the regions visited by the committee. In spite of all these evidence of non-delivery on the first contract, Jida went ahead and expanded the dressmaking model. This is where we will leave today and promise you that the way this is, we haven't even come to the recommendations, we haven't even come to the conclusions, we haven't even come to the government action paper, but we have just started going into the Jida report. We said, no matter how long it takes to release the report, we'll wait for the final report before we do our show. We have the final report, and this is where we discuss it most intelligently. 97.3 CTFM. My guest in the studio, Sydney is Leifold, a financial consultant who writes a very interesting weekly column uh, in a number of uh, websites. He'll be back tomorrow as we continue to go through the procurement and contracting bits. He was here.